I'll just, I'll just get going. Uh, so, if you want to hear a talk about cross-site scripting or SQL injection, you might as well leave the room now. Um, this is pretty much, this talks very much around uh, the fact that our industry is extremely busy, but things don't seem to get any better uh, in terms of application security. Um, and it's, it's not purely web security either. It can be things like you know, software security in general. So everything we know is wrong is probably a sweeping statement, but hopefully by the end of this you may agree with at least a small percentage of, uh, of what I'm going to talk about. So a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Owen Keery. I'm on the, the board of OWASP. Um, I'm, I'm from Dublin in Ireland. Um, I work with OWASP. We've been with OWASP for about 10 years. Um, and I, I suppose one of, one of the main, main projects I'm involved with would, would be the, the Code Review project. Um, Anybody here know what the code review project is? Anybody? Yeah. Okay. So, so pretty much uh, what I'd like to talk about is, is the fact that e even though um, we know how to fix all of these problems, right? We know how to fix buffer overflows, right? 30-year-old vulnerabilities, you know? We know how to fix cross-site scripting. That, you know, in effect, the phrase cross-site scripting was coined, you know, maybe 20 years ago. We're, we're getting old, right? Um, so we know how to fix all these problems, but you know, how many here are sort of pen tester guys? Uh, hands up. All right. How many here are sort of security consultant people, people that actually break code, breakers? How many breakers have you got? And is everybody else an auditor or something? Or you know, a shout out. What do you guys do? Uh, are, are you you know, are you, you you must be involved in software security at some point, so because you're here at this at this conference. So. If you look at all these organizations here, a lot of these organizations you'll recognize, right? These organizations, in my view, have no lack, relevantly speaking, I suppose, have no lack of, of resources of, of clever people. Um, you know, in, in effect, if, if any organization is going to have, um, you know, brain power and also awareness of security issues, um, it would be organizations like this, but there's something all of these organizations have pretty much in common, is that they've all been hacked in the last two, three years, right? Um, so m my view is, in effect, that if, um, if, if we have the brain power, if we have the budget, why are we not improving? Why, wh why is what we're doing not working? Like, there's lots of vendors out there. A lot of them s uh, sell pretty cool things, but do they actually solve the problem at its root cause? My view is they help, but I, I think the idea around um, fixing these problems is, is, is maybe more, it's not a technological problem, it's more about how we're approaching this problem in terms of uh, secure web applications, secure software, and that type of thing. All right. Here's an example of something that happened in, in Ireland, right? Um, loyalty build. Uh, loyalty builds were hacked a couple of weeks ago. They're based in Ireland. Uh, um, 1.1 million credit card numbers were stolen. Um, the hackers had access to the system for 30 days, um, and, and there has been fraud. So, so these guys broke in. Uh, the media at the time, anybody ever hear about this hack? It was one of the, it's one of the biggest breaches in Europe to date, uh, with that many credit cards. These guys, in effect, it's all common knowledge, were, were storing card data they shouldn't have, PCI, etc. Okay. So the thing was is that the, the media was saying it was a very advanced hack. Um, people in this room would probably, uh, you know, my view is that it was probably a SQL injection attack. But, but in effect, um, we, we see more and more of this type of thing, right? And in effect, it's, it's your data, it's my data. Um, loyalty builds were a company where you could buy things like, um, you know, offers by insurance, insurance companies, etc. Uh, and in effect, uh, you, could, you, could, you could get, you know, uh, offers and brand and percentages off, etc. But in, in, in effect, you know, it, it's been a huge breach, and it, pro it may even um, shut this company down. Who knows what's going to happen? So, you know, it's, you know, a couple of years ago, maybe 10 years ago, when I started talking about security, it was quite hard to find something really tangible to talk about, about, you know, what about this hack, what about that hack? But in effect, the, if, you know, the, the amount of breaches we see now on a daily basis are, are, are increasing exponentially. Um, so, you know, we, we have sort of a two-sided coin here, which is rather strange, right? Um, more statistics. We all love statistics. So the idea around, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge business. It's, uh, there's billions of do dollars of losses. Um, we have everything from malware infection 
to, to, to SQL injection, to cross-site scripting, to, you know, stealing people's data, right? A lot of the attacks we see in, in, in modern days, or we have things like loyalty breach, et cetera, or loyalty build, et cetera, which may be where a server-side breach. Um, we also have the fact of a lot of, you know, a lot of hackers now go for client sides, right? So it's easier to attack individuals as opposed to systems, right? Um, but then again, there's a duty of care here for developers and for us guys to try and, and, and help people write secure code. Um, the thing is that writing secure code is, is one part of, of, of a many faceted uh, approach. Uh, we have the tools, we have the knowledge, but we still don't see anything changing. Um, so pretty much the way it would be is that the more money we spend, we'd like to see, and the more time we put in, and the more of these huge conferences we have, uh, we'd like to see uh, the, the, the amount of incidents, incidences and, and also the, 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 the impact of these incidences re reducing. Um, and we don't see that, right? Um, so if you look at this from that point of view, it's like, I don't know about the health system over here, but the health system in Ireland is, we, you know, you have like a zillion dollar budget, but, you know, lots and lots of money gets pumped into a system, but it doesn't improve anything. So money is not going to fix this, right? Um, buying $50,000 tools will not fix this in my view. Um, a lot of attackers don't need a $50,000 tool to break into a website. You might need some sort of penetration testing proxy, a free and open scanner, and a notepad, right? Um, so, so even though we have WAFs, IDS, IPS, we have uh, you know all of these types of cool things, um, it's not really it's not really helping. It's not really working out too well for us. So you know, there's a couple of things there, right? In my view. We're, you know, and hopefully I've got that. My first message of the day, I hopefully we've got, we've got this right, is that in effect, um, we're, we are as security professionals, as an industry, are, are approaching this, this problem of software insecurity wrong. And we have been for years. But it's something like as more and more people do it, it, it becomes the norm. It becomes something that, well, this is how we do security. You know, we do a penetration test. Well, we write code and then we do a penetration test. And then, you know, uh, hopefully the, the penetration test will be, able, will be able to give us the ability to, to find these issues so the hackers don't find these issues, right? So there's a few points. The first one I want to make is, 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 is what I'd like to call is the asymmetric arms race. It's the idea that we have ethical hackers, we have systems and services which try to secure, and then we have guys on the bad side which in effect are trying to break. And it's pretty much an arms race in terms of um, all fixed. You know, if you look at the banking industry, we, uh, you know, we, my company, we work a lot with financial institutions. And that, uh, any one bank will, will incur an awful lot of fraud at any one time. But once they fix something, all the fraud and all the attacks move on to a, a separate entity. And it's sort of like outrunning a bear. You know, the idea around security is you don't need to outrun the bear, you just need to outrun the guy behind you. And that's very, very true in, in, terms of, in terms of security as well. Um, the idea of being secure is somewhat an illusion in my view as well. You may, you may be secure at a point in time, but we have things like Agile. Well, you know, we, we're pumping code out hourly. We have continuous integration and continuous deployment. So how do we keep track of that? How do we make sure that the code we're pumping out and we're deploying very, very quickly but, um, is secure? And one of the things around that is uh, pretty much, you know, it's, it's like a treadmill, um, but we need to do it because most code we write in the commercial sense reflects a business process. And the, the idea around uh, building code is we're trying to push, uh, you know, we're either trying to push users um, onto the internet to use the internet because it's cheaper to use, um, you know, and it's more cost effective, right? And you can track what a user does more, and you, you can sort of, uh, you can use analytics and like big data and all this type of thing to, to, to figure out, you know, what their trends are, what their habits are. So we have a push uh, in the business to, 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 to improve, to, to, uh, to include more widgets and functions to consume more of your data, of your personal data. But the thing is with asymmetric arms race is that we have a traditional model. A traditional model is, oh, I'm going to deploy uh, an application. I need to get a pen test done before we deploy, right? So ha like everybody's been there, right? In terms of as, as a developer, right? As a developer, you're saying, okay, you've got the code written. It's, it's in user acceptance environment. It's a stablish code. We'll get the pen test guys in, or we'll do it internally. We may have a, an internal resource. And then once you get, you get the tick in the box, you know, like PCI or a lot of financial services uh, organizations where have you had a pen test, and if you can tick that box, they go, you're good to go, go off and deploy, right? 
Well, the thing is, is that there, there are way too many variables and, and, and generally not enough time to ensure, I don't think we can ever, ever say ensure security anyway. What we can do is we can say we can help ensure security, we, we can sort of remove low-hanging fruit. But, but in terms of, of, uh, of saying you're 100% secure, you can never do that, right? We, we all agree with that, I think. Right? So, also, if you look at a particular application, you have all these technical attacks, what the scanners are really good at finding, right? Uh, your SQL injection attacks, your, your CSERF attacks, your, you know, your, your, uh, your uh, cross-site scripting attacks, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and tools are very, they, they can find these types of issues very easily because they have a sort of a signature that can be recognized by automation. And therefore, your automated scanner will find something, it will come back, and, and what you're really paying for when you buy automation is how it interprets the response from the server. But we have, also have a bunch of other types of things you have to worry about. In my experience, I've simulated stealing tens of millions of dollars from banks, but the majority of those attacks were due to business logic attacks. They were due to uh, breaking the business logic, breaking the authorization. No tool could find that because the tools, in effect, don't understand um, what, what, what business logic is. All tools can see is HTTP requests and responses, and they, you know, they, they match the parameters, etc. So this is pretty much where we are in terms of, of, our, of the world we live in. And this is the accepted world we live in, right? We have, uh, in effect, an application, 10, nine years. If everybody here coded a couple of lines, you know, we've got like, even for this, this, this talk, right? We've got like maybe 100 man hours of listening. Thank you very much for turning up, by the way. But um, in effect, right, you know, we have all this development time. And in this development time, we can have a number of, number of types of bugs, right? We can have business logic flaws, which are hard to find. The hard reason they're hard to find, in my view, is because you have to understand the business logic in order to break it, right? Um, you have code flaws, API calls, etc., insecure crypto, whatever that may be. And you also have things like security errors. So, but the model is, in effect, okay, we've got 10 years, uh, 10, nine years of development, and then we get two weeks of ethical hacking to, in effect, get all this stuff fixed or find all the bad stuff, right? So, you know, in functional testing, uh, as an ex-developer, um, you know, you, you, look, you, you look, talk about things called coverage or code coverage. And what we do when we want coverage is we want 80 to 90 percent coverage. So we want to, in effect, invoke 80 to 90 percent of the data paths in your application, right? So therefore, we can say we've tested this. So uh, with a large application and giving somebody two man weeks or two months, depending on the size in, in relevant terms, it, it's very much a losing battle, right? But there's a few other things there if you look, if you look at it on the, on, on the flip side, right? So on the top here, we have the attacker schedule, right? So this is the attacker over a period of time, whatever that may be. And the attacker's testing schedule on your web application is pretty uh, rigorous. Um, and then on the bottom half is the good guys, right? That's us, right? Well, I don't know. I can't speak for all of you, right? But in, in effect, we have the, 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 you know, our sort of our traditional model, right? So, you know, it, it's pretty much a very uh, a lopsided view of the world. And how can we, how can we, how can we secure applications if, if this is the model we use? And lo a lot of us use this model, right? Um, and, and the idea of using maybe continuous integration, etc. Like the idea of can we make code flow like water and pick up vulnerabilities on the way but not disrupt deployment is a, is a bit of a fantasy in my view because no matter what, at what point you find these vulnerabilities, you need human brains that you guys have to verify that's a real issue because you do not want to annoy developers, right? So... Pretty much a, a wise man that you guys may recognize is, is, is the idea around how risk comes from not knowing what we're doing. And in a lot of cases, we don't really know what we're testing. We don't know the purpose of the application or the criticality of it. We may not know on, on a very complex or, or, um, application. We may not understand exactly what all the various mo roles and models and data paths and transitions, etc. what you can and can't do. Some applications are very complicated matrices. So in order for a tester, in effect, to test every possible, major, uh, every tr possible transition, think of your application as, as a finite state machine, right? It has a number of states, and depending on the input, it changes from one state to another. But we need to understand that finite state machine, in effect, um, in order to break it. So we want to maybe bypass state B and go straight to state D or E or whatever that may be, right? So... <clears throat> In effect, I suppose the first point is, is around this time-limited approach. This, this, oh, we, you know, tick a box, we've done a pen test, 
um, hit the big red button for hack now, hit the big green button for secure now. The idea is even if you do have a large budget, even if you do have expensive tools, if you're not doing what you should be doing in terms of understanding what you're testing, um, and also maybe even using the tools as well, it, it can be a, a rather, uh, you know, an uphill battle is my view. Because if you look at it from the point of view of time-limited testing, right, tools, right, there's no tool on this earth that you can point to um, a point against uh, a, a decent complex application which you, it will just cover, it will scan, it will crawl, it will spider your application, find stuff, come back and say you're secure or you've got problems, right? Um, the, the idea around tuning tools is depending on your technology stack, what's, what, what, what APIs you're using, what dependencies are you using, because in effect about 80% of the code in your applications you probably never wrote yourself, right? And there's been studies on that, and I'm alluding to something I'll talk about in a few minutes. So, so in this time-limited box of testing, we, in effect, have a consultant that needs to tune tools. The other approach I find is quite good from the point of view of technical uh, vulnerability testing and technical hacking is to use multiple tools. Because tools, in effect, either say something um, is there when it isn't, which is a false positive, and even worse, they say nothing's wrong, which is a false negative, right? If you have a number of tools doing the same thing, they come back with the same answer in certain cases and different answers in other cases, it gives you a little more help in terms of what the hell am, 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 am I, am I, you know, should I be concern, concerned about, okay? Um, so we also have things like technology stack and customization. So, you know, are we using an LDAP backend? Is it Oracle? Is it MySQL? Um, are we using JSON anywhere, et cetera? And obviously, generic vanilla attacks may not uh, detect, or vectors, et cetera, may not detect um, uh, particular types of, of issues which are present because we're, we're testing it with the wrong stuff. We're using the wrong tools or the wrong vectors. And again, as I said, we need to get a lot of coverage as well. So the thing is, is that we have to talk about experience. And we have to say, okay, well, how good, is the bad, how good are the bad guys? Well, as you can see from this sort of the, the, the bad guys testing schedule, they've got 365 by 7 by as long as they want. Well, you've got, you got like two weeks, right? So it's a really tough thing to, to, to secure applications in that way. So even if you have all the tools, et cetera, in my view, I don't think you can, in effect, uh, prevent hackers getting in um, with sort of a, a, very, a very much a, a point-in-time snapshot, right? The other thing around, around this is that code gets pushed frequently, right? So the idea is that you put code you can push maybe every couple of weeks or whatever. So your point-in-time snapshot, in effect, erodes over time. So on the day we deliver a report, the delay, day we, we upload our, our vulnerability data to our, to our GRC system or whatever that may be, um, as code gets pushed the next day, the next week, the next month, the value of that starts to drop, right? The value of that penetration test, because the code is changing. Um, you know, you, you, you sort of what you've, what you've tested against in a month's time, um, in many ways, could be completely different, right? So, so if, you're getting, if you're getting your one pen test a year to be compliant, or you know, if you're getting your, you know, um, sort of your ticking boxes, compliance and security are completely different in my view anyway. But in effect, our, we think a window of exploitation. Um, maybe Jeremiah talked about that earlier on, but the idea is that as code changes, our window of exploitation can grow because we haven't tested it since the code changed, right? So the idea of a point in time isn't, isn't, isn't that good. We also have tools which don't do everything the vendors say they do. Now, I'm not going to name any names here, but the idea around client-side stuff. So in the old days, we had fat clients and fatter servers, and then we moved to the internet, which was browsers and fat servers. And now we have, we're back to the idea of mobile phones with native clients, which are fat, and we have fat servers again. So we've gone backwards a bit. You know, we've, the paradigm has changed, right? We also have a lot of functionality, et cetera, on the client side. Um, things like DOM cross-site scripting. DOM cross-site scripting doesn't need HTTP, right? Um, so, so therefore, uh, a, a, the majority, if not all tools, there's a couple of them, in effect, can't test for DOM XSS. So how you test for DOM XSS is you need to do some form of tainting or JavaScript analysis, right, to see where, where the sources and the sinks are. So the idea of just scanning, even just for technical issues, isn't good enough because it, there's a flavor of client-side attacks that, that, that many, many tools can't, can't detect, right? Uh, I believe Zap, the new version of Zap, has made some attempt on this, which I, I'm very eager to see. 
Um, there's also a pretty good link. Um, there's a DOM access at West Wiki. I, I'm not going to talk about it in detail, but it, it, shows, it gives you some great examples in terms of DOM attacks. Um, I'm not going to get into what a DOM attack is. If you don't know, go to the OWASP website and read it. Um, so the, in effect, we need something like an onion. So I have a little dancing man and I have robots here. So that's the idea that, in effect, we have various things we can do, either automated or we can do it combined. We need to do things like design review and threat modeling. Uh, some people say threat modeling is just like risk, risk assessment, but it's a cool name. And there's a lot more to it. And for me, for threat modeling is you can get people, not just security people in the room. You can get people like, um, you know, business people, uh, project managers, developers, and security people. And for an enterprise system, threat modeling is great because it, it in effect, um, could give you, everybody in the room for the first time uh, an end-to-end -end view of your web application, right? For the first time, he can give you uh, a view of where the choke points are in your application. Where does your data reside? What, what important data resides where? Where does it go to and where does it, you know, where, where, you know, where's the interaction? Where's the user input? Where's the internal input? All that type of thing. Uh, we also have code of view, which is uh, close to my heart, and SAS, which is static code of view, um, static analysis, which is like automated stuff. And then something else which is, I think is important as well in terms of, the, of, of approaching this is, is, is negative use case or abuses. So teach your QA people to break systems. Teach your QA people to write test cases which break your code. Teach your QA people to write negative systems. So rather than uh, uh, testing for a particular path of execution, get them to try and break that. That is not hard to do. It's a very powerful thing in terms of getting QA involved. The QA will actually like to do that as well if they're not too busy. But also then we have the live and ongoing thing. So we have our website out there. Um, there may be still vulnerabilities there we haven't covered because obviously we're pushing ahead all the time. We need to deploy. We can't hold up, uh, you know, uh, progress. So things like continuous and frequent monitoring. The idea is that we're continuous testing. Uh, manual validation is really important. I'll talk about that in a while, but it's very important in terms of not, excuse my French, but pissing developers off, right? Uh, we, do want, we do not want to come back with a, a tome of data. I give that to the developer and say, fix all this stuff, because you do not need to do that to be uh, secure. So f pretty much the idea is that robots are good at, at detecting uh, known unknowns, and humans are, are much better at unknown unknowns, so business logic issues. Robots are not very good at, at detecting that type of thing. But, but there's more. Um, cheeseburgers. I'm not American, but I love cheeseburgers. I like barbecue when it's not raining in Ireland, but uh, so we, we do get the odd uh, barbecue at least twice a year. <clears throat> so, um, cheeseburger security is a really nice way of talking to people about why should we bother with security. And this is sort of an analogy. Um, so, you know, if you go to McDonald's or, or, or get a hot dog, you know, I had to get a, a hot dog on Times Square yesterday, you know, just to, you know, it's like uh, sort of one of those things when you go on. Uh, uh, you know, a religious trip, you have to try it, so I did that. Um, the, the idea is, is that they're pretty bad for us, but you know, a lot of us eat them. Vegetarians won't get this joke, but hopefully uh, other people will. But we, we also know that if we eat too many, they're bad for us, make it a heart attack. But that's, that doesn't stop us eating them, right? Because they're tasty and juicy and nice. Um, but we also write secure code, insecure code that way. Well, we'll keep, we'll keep uh, writing it until we, something bad happens. So if you keep eating your cheeseburgers, in effect, the idea is, is that you'll keep eating them until the doctor says, hey, take it easy on the cheeseburgers, eat the granola, and go for a walk once in a while. And then you go, wow, yeah, I shouldn't have had all those cheeseburgers. And the thing is, is that like, if we talk about it in terms of secure code, we, we may tend to write secure code until something goes wrong, and then you go, wow, now I know what security is all about. I got a call at three this morning saying we had a breach. So it's sort of a decent analogy in terms of, uh, you know, why security is sort of important or, you know, uh, it's, it's like an unknown, but until it comes to fruition, and then you might be in trouble. All right. <coughs> so I, I talk about food and I talk about security because I think everybody can relate to food in some manner. Um, so this is a, an example of, of a software food chain. Uh, the idea is that we have a piece of application code that one of us have written. We're using commercial off-the-shelf stuff, uh, so we're using plugins, maybe some integrated stuff, maybe uh, 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 an instant messaging piece for a banking application that we don't want to write ourselves, so we plug that in. We're using some form of calculator, which you bought, you purchased, some sort of mapping technology, whatever it may be. And, or else, the, the other cases, maybe we've outsourced some stuff, or else we, we actually have code which has been internally used as well. 
in any of those cases, you'll probably see that the commercial stuff may be using widgets and parts of functionality from uh, outsourced developers themselves. And they, in effect, may be using subcontractors. So the, the, the degrees of trust sort of erode as you go out, right? Um, you may be using third-party APIs. You may be using components from third parties, which is in commercial code. It's in code in shrimp, shrink wrap boxes. But in effect, um, you pretty much don't know. I, I, I don't know if you guys heard about this. It was a thing uh, last summer about the, the horse meat in the... You heard about that, no? The horse meat? All right, so the idea was that there was beef going around Europe being sold, but it was actually dead horses, right? Uh, we, we didn't know it was in the food, right? And it's, it's, it's all been cleared up now, no, nothing to see here, but in effect, uh, it, <laughs> uh, uh, but, but in effect uh, it's the same way with our code, I believe, right? That, that, that we all, and that this isn't a bad thing, but it's something to be aware of, in my view. But, but it gets a bit interesting when you look at the statistics, right? So in 2012, there was a uh, study of 31 popular open source libraries. Some of the companies outside, some of the guys from OWASP, et cetera, were, were involved in this. Uh, there was lots of downloads. 26% of the downloads had a known vulnerability, right? So these are from SourceForge, from Git, from whatever. These are Apache applications. These are like stuff that we know and trust and love. We would never reinvent the wheel and do it ourselves. And that's why we use this stuff, and that's cool. <clears throat> but, but the thing is, is that, um, in, in effect, with our applications, we also have the idea that uh, if you look at how many lines of code you've written versus how much is actually written to ruin your application, about 80% of your code base you never wrote yourself. It's stuff you've pulled in from Git. But you've got, a, you've got an MD5 hash on that, so you're good to go. You know, you can just compare and make sure there's nothing wrong with it, right? Here's <laughs> a few examples. Uh, Spring, for example, 18 million times downloaded, 43,000 organizations. Um, it had a pretty serious uh, issue. Um, you can look it up, the slides will be on, but uh, I'm not going to sort of cite, you know. But in effect, you can see that this, th th these are people that may have used this version of Spring. These are people, in effect, that uh, wrote, probably wrote some great code, may have been secure, may not have been secure. But the thing is with, with this is that um, uh, their bespoke code was sitting on, on a vulnerable platform in the first place, right? So that's a pretty tough challenge. How you might even know that? But the thing is, is that the people that wrote Spring are humans as well. Like Spring is not some sort of code that's always going to be secure. So the, I think the takeaway point is that even though we can write secure code, we also have the idea that we need to get everybody to write it. Because otherwise we may have like castles, you know, made you know, of sand in effect. And as soon as something happens, uh, things go bad. So the question is, do we, do we test for dependency issues? Um, dependency issues, right. So, so this is like patch management, right? So we've all been uh, in the middle of a presentation and then the window will pop up saying, I'm going to shut down in 10 minutes to reboot because I've just applied a load of patches to your Windows box, right? We've also been in the position where, oh, we did an upgrade to our SQL Server or Oracle um, web server last week and now it's broken everything. But we need to do these things and, we, and we do, most organizations have a patching policy around operating systems, around databases, around that type of infrastructure. The infrastructure we're comfortable with, the stuff we know and love. Um, you know, you can get updates as well to your phones now, et cetera. But we just, you know, accept that, right? You know, we accept it, and it's weird that we accept patches, because if you bought a card and needed a patch as often as we saw black software, you'd probably bring the card back. So the idea around this is, do we look at, 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 at a patching policy for our underlying frameworks, like our, our Spring, our Struts, um, you know, our MVC4.net, whatever it may be? Do we manage that? Most companies don't. The link below is to an open source piece. I think, I think it may be an OWASP project now, but you, you can point it to your web int file and it goes off and looks at the jar files and sees if any of those jar files have known vulnerabilities, which is pretty neat as well. Okay. And the next thing is around biting off more we can choose. So the idea is that, okay, some of this work for large organizations. You may have tens or hundreds of web applications and servers and all that type of thing. And we're sort of trying to, you know, you have this idea of ongoing improvement. We're trying to get better. We're trying to fix stuff. We're trying to reduce the amount of issues we have. We're trying to reduce the attack footprint. We're trying to, um, you know, get rid of all the low-hanging fruit or maybe even some of the medium stuff. And if, and if we have a lot of time, we'll get some of the very complex issues as well. But if you have a lot of sites, a lot of systems, how can we know we're improving if you don't know how to measure that in the first place? It's really tough. You can say, I fixed 10 bugs today, right? But the thing is that, you, you know, the, the thing you didn't say is that you have 8 million bugs in the backyard that you haven't even talked about, right? So you need to sort of uh, figure out um, 
you need to measure this, but also in terms of measurement, it's not bean counting. Vulnerabilities aren't all the same. Not all bugs are equal. And what we need to do is try and measure and look at business context from a point of view of risk for each of these types of issues that we find. So the idea around large-scale vulnerabilities, right? Um, again, if, if you have lots and lots of infrastructure, uh, uh, internet, internet facing, we need to, in effect, sort of say, um, okay, how do we know what to fix? We've got a finite amount of time. We've got a finite budget. Our, we can't spend all our developer time fixing bugs. We need to write the next thing, right? So that's a tough one. But so the idea will be to try and pick the bugs that mean something, the, 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 the bugs and vulnerabilities which actually may cause a real risk to your organization as opposed to every bloody bug on the report. But we're not very good at doing that as security people. As security people, we go, it's cross-site scripting, it's a high risk, right? It's SQL injection, it's a high risk. And the thing is, is that in many cases, depending on the business context, it may not be a high risk, right? It could be a cross-site script on an admin console that two people on the planet have. You need to have certificate authentication and an 800 key character password, right? So what's the attack surface? What's the, what's the probability of that cross-site script actually being um, you know, used to attack? Probably very little. All right. So that's pretty much the, you know, where we are in the moment, at the moment, where we have lots of attackers and we have less and less uh, you know, in terms of making decisions, etc. So we need to consume this data. We need to consume the fact that we, if we have 300 web applications, the traditional model will be, let's, let's have 300 Word documents every year, and let's just go through these 300 Word documents and figure out what we need to do. And, and in, in effect, you know, we also, as we talked about, you know, we have different penetration testers doing different work, using different tools and all that type of thing. So it's a hard one to judge. So we have this sort of fabulous view of the world, which is ESI, Enterprise Security Intelligence. Enterprise, uh, Security Intelligence. It's the idea of trying to consolidate, uh, to try and correlate data, um, to try and continually active, uh, actively monitor, uh, particularly for low-hanging fruit. Um, and also there's lots of vulnerability management solutions that are out there. But it, this sort of moves away from the traditional pen test approach, which is important. The other thing around this is that the, the, uh, is what we're looking for here when we start doing it in a continuous manner is deltas. We're looking for change. So the first time we do our, our assessment, the first time we do our scan, it's pretty hard, right? There's a lot of manual validation. There's a lot of work figuring out are these real issues, what's the risk of this issue, etc. Like, you know, in a lot of tools, you get an informational issue, and then you look into it, and you go, wow, that's a really bad issue, like, because it, it, the tool doesn't understand what, what's being exposed, right? But, but, but then every subsequent test after it then is a delta. It's a delta of the previous one. It actually gets a lot better. You start to track. You start to get metrics. You start to be able to measure. And I, I, that, for me, is something that we need to do a bit better as well. So we talk about vulnerability management, right? We need, we need metrics, right? We need uh, to measure what we have, um, but because we can't prove uh, th things we can't measure, in my view. Priority is important as well. Um, we'll talk about it in a while. But then the, the delta side of the thing I talked about already. But in effect, then we can start to look at improvement, look at change. Um, and then we can also demonstrate the value of security to our businesses, right? We can say, well, we got rid of five or ten issues which could have caused a catastrophic failure of our systems, and, you know, and, and you know, we're tracking this all along. It's pretty important. But the idea around, um, for anybody that's been in this game as long as me, it, it's very much around you know, the answering the question in, in the lift to, to the executive floor, and the C, uh, CISO or the CEO says, are we secure today? And most people know in terms of security, our dirty little secret is, I haven't got a damn clue, but, right? <laughs> But, but, but maybe you can say, well, you, you know, we have done a lot of stuff. We're tracking that data. We, you know, we've closed off X amount of high risk issues. And things are, you know, we can see somewhat a uh, relevant improvement, right? And we need to do that. We don't do that very well. Um, that's my opinion. So the other thing around this is around information flooding. This is like the idea around melting developers' brains, about being compliant, about sort of, in my view, a lot of the stuff that us security people deliver is white noise. It's the idea that, 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 we, that, that we, you know, we talk about what's wrong, we beat people up, as opposed to telling them what's right. What, what are they doing well? Um, so context is very important, right? Um, so, so doing things right doesn't mean doing the right things, right? So you can't do everything right, but at least do the things that matter to your business. Uh, bugs and vulnerabilities aren't equal, as I mentioned already. 
And context, as you can see from my Dick Tracy cartoon, if you read that out of context, it, it may mean one thing, but it's actually it's about Dick Tracy, right? Um, so the other thing is developers, do they need to fix everything, right? I don't think they do, right? I think they need to, in effect, figure out um, which issues are a risk to my business. Not, not, not a technical vulnerability, a risk to my business. Um, because if you, can, if you have 10 issues and you can only fix three of them, you, you, you pick the three which may actually have uh, you know, an impact if they were used to, to, to exploit or hack. Um, but the thing is, our, our view of the world is we need to be compliant, we need to have zero bugs, um, because they're called security bugs, but actually they're bugs. They're just bugs in software, they're the same as any other bug, but some of them are, are, are sort of labeled as security bugs. And in my view, when we talk to, to developers about sort of we give them reams and reams of issues to fix, um, my view is a lot of that is just white noise. It's the idea that we're just sort of um, hosing developers, wasting their time, as opposed to also not explaining to them very well. We're very good at acronyms in the security business. We're very good at sort of sexy sort of acronyms, right? Um, there's some great YouTube videos about that. But the thing is, is that, you know, we, those acronyms mean, maybe mean a lot to all of us. We can get into a bar and we can have a complete 10-hour conversation, not use one real word of English, right? The thing is, is that, you know, developers don't really care about that stuff, right? Developers, in effect, want to understand how do I fix it, what is the issue, how do I fix it, and how can I prevent from doing it again, right? Um, I don't think we're very good at doing that. But there's also compliance. So in the EU, is where I am in, in Ireland, there's a directive being passed. It's the idea, I think that half a percent of annual turnover has gone up to, I think it's two now, they've increased it to make the stick bigger. But if, you, if you're found negligent that you're not securing your data and you're a global organization, like Ireland's got like lots of organizations like Twitter and Apple and LinkedIn and all this stuff in Ireland. Um, if, you're, if, you're in, if you're a European entity or you have some incorporation in Europe and you're found that you, you have a privacy breach and you cannot prove that you've done as much as you can to prevent that, it doesn't mean you'll never get breached, right? It's called resilience, isn't it? It's not, you're never going to be 100% secure. But if you can say, well, yeah, we have an SCLC, we have developer training, we have awareness, we use SAS, we have some design security, we're doing pen testing on a regular basis, you know, we have continuous monitoring, whatever it may be, at least you won't get your ass sued uh, for half, half of 1% of your annual turnover, which can be quite, quite a lot of money for large organizations. That's, well, that's a, that for me, compliance is probably decent. It sort of drives awareness on the, on the C-suite, on the C-level. It drives awareness that, hey, dude, I don't want to get sued. Are we doing anything on security? Uh, can we spend more money on security? Uh, and sort of it gives them sort of, a, sort of like the law is catching up with the problems we all face, right? But then we have another sort of form. This is a little bit dated because when I used this slide before, Kinder Eggs were illegal in the U.S., but they're not anymore. They were, so thank you very much. I'm going to take credit for that one. This is another form of compliance. Is that the guys came in from, from uh, over the over the border with Kinder eggs, and they got fined two and a half thousand dollars per egg because the uh, poor American children might get choke on the on the plastic things inside the eggs, right? So, so you know, this is in my view is compliance gone mad. But as developers, we also deal with this madness as well, right? We 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 deal with this non-compliant ticks that nobody wants to see. But have they made your organization any more secure? I have no idea. Right. So that's just an update that they are legal in the USA, and you're very welcome for that one. Um, <clears throat> so, the, so the, look, just to sort of this conclude, um, what we talk about developers, we talk about issues. We need to talk to developers in, 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 in sort of a clear way, in developer speak. Because in my experience, if you have pen tester guys talking to developers, the first thing the developer will ask you is, how many lines of code have you ever written in your life? Um, you know, developers do not want to be told their babies are ugly by somebody that's never written a line of code in their lives, right? <laughs> so, so, so it, it, rather than saying you have a second-order SQL injection, what the hell does that mean? Do I care? Look, just use parameterized queries and the problem goes away. It's a lot easier to say that way, right? Um, so so when we talk, talk about that type of thing, well, we don't do a very good job of it, right? So my view is, you know, is cross-site scripting the same as SQL injection? Now, a lot of people are going, certainly not. How could they be? One is a client-side attack. One's on a back-end database. You know? So the thing is, is that both are injection attacks and, and, and sort of 
The idea with it is that, you know, the code and the data are being, so the data being the untrusted data and the code are being confused, right? So in terms of SQL injection, we're injecting ANSI SQL and we're doing things, you know, that the, that the developer never intended. And across its scripting, we're injecting maybe markup in JavaScript, which is being rendered as opposed to being encoded, right? So they are the same, right? You're breaking from the data context into the execution context. So all of these things, LDAP injection, command injection, log injection, blah, 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 in my view are all the same, right? Um, like the remediations are slightly different, but they're all the same thing. At the end of the day, hackers want to inject code into your system to do stuff, right? So that, the, that's, that's my, my sort of my view of, of sort of cross-site scripting, is in effect that we're breaking out of the data context, which is the user input, or the input from an external source, and, we're, and we're, it becomes execution context, because we're using the, le the, the left angle bracket, which tells the browser to wake up and start processing stuff, maybe JavaScript, maybe markup, okay? SQL injection is the same thing. Command injection is the same thing. They're all the same things. So if you, if you talk to developers in this way, I find the conversation is a lot easier. The fixes are slightly different. Encoding is, is the main thing for cross-site scripting. Parameterized queries for SQL injection. And probably some stringent uh, command injection stuff, or maybe don't let your web application talk to your file system is probably another one, right? But you know, that's, that's old school, but you still do find it, right? So pretty much to conclude, I'm running ahead of time, that's okay. Um, we need to understand what, what we're protecting against. Um, we need to figure out, you know, um, when, we're, when we're trying to break um, applications, it's not only um, your technical vulnerabilities we need to actually, uh, you, know, you know, look at and, uh, and sort of assess. It's we have to understand what we're testing, right? We have to understand how we're breaking things. Um, a pen test alone is a losing battle. I hope you agree with me on that. Um, we can only improve what we can, me what, what we can measure. I think that's e decent, because how can we measure improvement at all anyway? Um, bugs are not created equal. We do not need to fix every bug. Um, and then, again, you know, all, all code which, which causes a bug of, of one description or another, they're all bugs. You can call some of them security bugs if you want, but at the end of the day, they're bugs, and they should be treated in such a way. Uh, I, I think that's more palatable. Um, I, I, I think the, the, the result of that bug m may cause an issue in terms of the word privacy or the word, um, you know, theft. But in effect, they are all bugs, right? Like, as developers, we're very, very happy to, to code an authentication page. It's a no-brainer, right? We need an authentication page. Why? Because I, I don't want anybody else to log in or see my stuff. We need a login page to identify who's on the system. So, but that's security. But then when we talk about things like cross-site scripting, CSERF, DOM, XSS, whatever that may be, because of the way we talk about it, um, developers don't really get it as well because we sort of wrap it up into a fancy little security box and go, you know, I know you're not as cool as me, but here's all your vulnerabilities, and, you know, go and fix them. And we need, we need to break out of that mold as well. All right. That's all I'm going to talk about. I think I've run a bit ahead in time. But is any questions at all before I go and get a here at the bar. Anybody? Mm. That's cool. All right. Thank you. Cheers.